on, everybody. It's Mr. Gustin. I'm back in the physics classroom. We're going to recap what we did today in terms of free fall uh, objects, objects that we dropped vertically. Where we started today was we talked about me and Mrs. Gustin on our honeymoon going skydiving in Hawaii, okay? And we talked about what's going on with skydiving. I asked you a couple questions. I said, when we first jump out of the plane, we're not parachuting yet. We are just popped out of the plane. I asked you, I said, hey, what forces are acting on us as we initially leave the plane? What force is pulling us to the ground? And we talked about gravity. So we went ahead and we said, okay, gravity pulls on us downward in this way. I label it FG, the force of gravity. And we talked about how that motion might change. As we fall, if this is the force of gravity, we undergo a constant acceleration. And that constant acceleration is constant because the force of gravity is constant, but our speed increases constantly. And so our displacement over time undergoes this like increasingly increasing fashion. So I sketched the model of this, which we did in class. After one second, I'm gonna kind of boil myself down to a point. Initially, I'm here. After one second in time, I've only traveled a little distance. But after two seconds in time, I've traveled a greater distance. And after three seconds of time have passed, I've traveled a greater distance. And after four seconds, I've traveled an even greater distance. I am increasing the distance I fall as I fall. Why? Well, I'm doing that because my speed increases every second because I'm constantly accelerating. And so we can see that the force of gravity pulls us to the Earth, causes us to accelerate, and results in a couple of kinematic graphs that look like this. We said we're going to use a yt graph now because we're moving in the vertical direction. We start above the ground, moving very slowly, but our velocity quickly increases. So we see a downward opening parabola, if I'm calling up here, zero meters displacement, okay? Then down here might be negative, whatever the height is, negative change in y way down here. So I'm moving backward or downward, but I start moving uh, very slowly and increase. If I'm thinking about a VT graph here, I'm going to have to extend my quadrant down to the negative quadrant where I start from rest and I increasingly speed up, an increasing velocity in the negative direction. And then we can talk about an AT graph. Well, it's a constant negative acceleration. And this is where our question for the day came from. Well, what is this acceleration? What is the acceleration as a result of the force of gravity? Before we got there, we talked about a very real thing that takes place during skydiving, and that's air resistance. No, it would be crazy to think that I jump out of the plane with Mrs. Gustin on our honeymoon and we never slow down. We just plummet towards the earth. That's not what happens. At a certain point, we slow down because another outside force balances out the gravity force or is larger than the gravity force that allows us to now slow down or accelerate upward as we move down. And that's air resistance. And so we talked a little bit about air resistance and why certain things have air resistance. And I showed this demo in class. I said, okay, I have two pieces of paper. Two, two pieces of paper that look very similar, okay? Same mass, same shape, came out of the same ream of paper. But one, I crumpled up. And I said, all right, if I take these two pieces of paper, I drop them to the ground, what do you think is going to happen? And so I did that in class. And the piece of paper, the crumpled paper, falls very quickly. But the piece of paper does not fall very quickly. There was clearly an outside force pushing up on it while gravity pulled down on it. Now, they're the same mass. They have the same force of gravity pulling down on them, but one drops much more slowly. So we had to ask ourselves, why do some objects experience this uh, non-negligible air resistance and other objects don't. And so we brainstorm that objects that are uh, smooth, objects that are small and have large masses tend to have a negligible air resistance. Objects that are not very massive, pretty light, and spread out large surface areas like my sheet of paper or a parachute have non-negligible air resistances. So there are some objects that we have to consider air resistance for. But in the scope of this course, we ignore those. All of the objects we have in our course that we talk about, we can ignore air resistance with. They've got a pretty high surface area, I'm sorry, a pretty low surface area to mass ratio, meaning surface areas are small and masses are high, decreasing that ratio. So for the most part, we ignore air resistance. For objects that are free falling, objects that are dropping, our forces are gonna only be the force of gravity 
pulling them down. So today in class, we had a couple examples. We used uh, tennis balls, we used golf balls, we used basketballs, we used baseballs, we used all of these kinds of different objects in our lab today. And the lab is called the G-Wiz lab. And if you look at my objects here, they're all pretty small, but their mass and their weight are, uh, I'm sorry, their weight and their surface area are pretty low. Like there's not a lot of air resistance on these objects as they move. That's kind of why we use them for sports. So here's what the lab looked like. It was the G Wiz lab in your packet. So G, baby G, Wiz is the lab we used, or did. And we went out to the bleachers and we dropped these objects. So here's what we did. We took different objects for different groups, but all had very low surface area to mass ratios, and we dropped them. We dropped them from various heights. We dropped them from here, from here, all the way up the bleachers, all the way to the top of the home bleachers. So we dropped them, and we timed them. We were able to use a couple of tools. The two tools we used were a meter stick and a stopwatch. And so here's a sample data we got over here. We got, uh, <coughs> excuse me. We got time data for how long it took objects to fall, and we got some vertical displacement data over here. Now, if you analyze these numbers, no. The top of the bleachers are not 1.6 meters. The top of the bleachers are much, much, much larger, but these are just, this is just some sample data in case you missed our lab. You can go ahead and pop this into your data table on the lab. Now, the big question we were asked here, uh, one of the big goals, because there are two big goals. The first big goal is to determine the average velocity for the objects at different heights. That's goal number one. And if you remember, average velocity equals two different things. I can do either change in vertical position over time. That one might work for my data. Or I can go ahead and use final velocity plus initial velocity over two for objects undergoing constant acceleration. And guess what? Because we had a constant force, I was undergoing constant acceleration. This equation works too. But given my data, given what I measured, uh, I probably have to use the first one to find my average velocity at these uh, six different locations. Okay. That's goal one. Goal two was to then calculate the final speed of the object at these different locations. That's goal number two, find final speed to help me calculate acceleration to these different spots. Now, I'm using this equation here to find average speed at the different locations. I know that the initial velocity, because I dropped them, was zero. I should be able to use this equation right here to help me calculate final velocity, or the velocity of the ball right before it hits the ground. So I want you to use that, and then take that data, analyze that data to help yourself figure out the solution to goal number two, which is determining the acceleration of these objects as they approach the ground from different heights. Okay? If you got questions, let me know. Otherwise, see ya!